Okay, let's go. All right. Thanks for joining us, guys. Um, we're the Raspberry Pi half of the Astro Pi team. I'm Aaron. I'm Ben. I'm Richard. Um, and we're here to answer any of your Mission Space Lab questions. Um, so I just wanted to kick things off by uh, letting you all know that you should have received your Astro Pi kits by now. Um, if anyone hasn't received their kit in the mail, please do send us an email um, or just respond to one of the newsletters that we send out um, and we will get that sorted for you as soon as possible. Um, uh, also a really important reminder is that everything, all the information that we're going to cover today is covered in the phase two guide. So um, definitely refer to that if you are trying to understand a bit better the AstroPy hardware or how you should be writing your programs. Um, so let's kick it off with some of the questions that you sent in to us. Okay, let's go. So thanks very much for sending these questions in. That was really great. Um, I'm going to jump straight in with the first one we received which came from the excellently named team, Mostly Harmless. And the question was, uh, what should we do if we need to use a library that is not in the list of consented libraries? Ben, what should they do? OK, so we covered this in the phase two guide. Um, so we've, we've tried to install as many uh, useful libraries on the Astro Pi Flight OS as possible, uh, including everything people requested last year in their experiments. And we've added in a few more, uh, such as TensorFlow, which is new to the Raspberry Pi this year. So we're um, that's kind of really hot at the moment. So uh, if you want to be doing some um, really advanced kind of um, machine learning stuff, you've got that as well. Um, now, if you um, find yourself looking to use a library that's not in that uh, included list, um, do talk to us. Give us an email. Uh, ask, tell us about wh what you want to use the library for, and um, we might be able to find a, an alternative for you that, that's already um, that's already available. Uh, there's a very small chance we might be able to make uh, adjustments for depending on what your use case is, um, but generally try and stick to the list. Uh, but as I say, get in touch with any specific questions and we'll, uh, we'll follow up from there. Okay, okay so uh, the next question. Um, have the pictures in Flickr been taken with the Pi Noir camera? So that's the, uh, the infrared camera. So yes, the answer to that is yes. Uh, so, all of the photographs that we that we released on Flickr were taken in last year's uh, competition. They were all from uh, the Life on Earth experiments, because uh, remember, Life on Earth is studying, uh, looking down on Earth from the uh, fr uh, from the infrared uh, camera on um, Astro Pi Izzy. So that's the one that's that's in the window looking down at Earth. All the ones that are inside are, are doing life in space. Um, and those photographs don't get published afterwards. Uh, they, they can be, you, can, you can take photos in those experiments, uh, look, at the, look at the results, but then you have to get rid of the photographs. So all the ones we released were taken on Izzy using the infrared camera. Great. So uh, the, the next question has been asked a few times um, in different ways. HRE team and um, Feynman's 100. I assume that's named after the great physicist Richard Feynman, another great team name there. And they've been asking questions about storage space and how much storage space is available. And also what the size of the SD card is. So the thing to be aware of is that the size of the SD card doesn't matter because each team's experiment has a limit of three gigabytes. So if you're coding your experiment up, the maximum amount of data you can save is three gigabytes. If your program starts to generate more than three gigabytes of data, the program will be terminated. Um, the way we run experiments for Astro Pi is we've written um, one of our own programs that loads each of the experiments in turn and runs them. And it also checks to see how much disk space is being used. So if you go over that three gigabyte limit, your program will be terminated. So that's really important when you're testing to make sure you're not going to exceed three gigabytes. Remember, your experiment will run for three hours, so you should definitely test your experiment um, and your code running it for three hours and looking at how much data is generated. If you're using the cameras in your experiment, it's worth bearing in mind that um, a camera, a picture of a blank wall, like the one behind me, will actually be a much smaller file size than a picture that's got lots of detail in it. So think about um, your test images. If you're going to use the Pi camera for your tests, which I strongly encourage you to do, make sure it's taking pictures of something interesting rather than just a blank color, because that will give you a much more accurate idea of how much disk space you're going to be using. Um, the next question 
uh, is... Um, is it possible to filter the infrared data from the normal Astro Pi camera? Uh, ben, do you want to answer this one? Yep. Uh, so, uh, no. So the, the, the camera used in uh, life in, spa in space experiments uh, is not the infrared camera, it's the regular visible light camera. So that doesn't have the infra infrared filter removed. So no, it's not possible to filter the infrared data out of those photographs. Alright, so um, next question is that it seems that we can't install the OpenCV Python module with the method described in the phase two guide. Are you aware of this problem? So uh, the phase two guide uh, does cover how to install the libraries separately, but really it's just talking about the actual Python library. So for OpenCV to work, you also need um, one of the Debian packages that's part of Raspbian to be installed. Um, generally though, if you want to install packages that are being used on the Astro Pi, the absolute best way of doing that is to run the one line installer script as explained in the phase two guide, because that will make sure you get all the dependencies and all the software you need. Um, we've actually now removed the, the pip install instructions from the phase two guide just to make sure it's really clear. Um, so the kits you receive from ESA, they should have on it uh, an SD card with Raspbian installed. And that's just the standard version of Raspbian you can download from our website. If you run the one line installer script, that will install all the packages and everything else you need so that your Raspberry Pi will now have um, an environment that's almost exactly the same as the one that you'll face when your code's running on the ISS. And uh, just to add to that, uh, we've also uh, released uh, two image files that, that you can download and install straight onto an SD card. So it's not a one line installer, it's just a, an image file that you would write to the SD card and when you boot it, it's got everything uh, that the Azure Pi has. So you've got all the libraries and everything set up. There's two of those. So there's one uh, has the desktop and a, and a Python editor that you can use. Uh, the other one is a light image. So just command line only, which is exactly what uh, is uh, on the flight OS in, uh, that's going to be in space. So that's the best one for uh, the, the, the desktop one is the best one to develop your code on because you get the desktop and you can use the internet browser and you can um, you can use a, the Python editor of your choice. And but when you want to test your code for um, for real, you're best off doing that on the uh, on the light image. It's worth remembering all that is explained in a lot more detail in the phase two guide. So you should read that. Uh, the next question is also something that's covered in the phase two guide, and it's um, from the team. Uh, R. Um, which one is the name of the main program, main.py or astropy underscore main.py? Erin, quick answer for that one. That's an easy one. It's main.py. Yeah, so your program should be called main.py. That's what you should submit with your experiment. Uh, our next question is, is Raspberry Pi easy fixed to the ISS windows or is it floating in the air freely? Um, has the Pi any type of relative motion regarding to the ISS? Ben, do you want to answer that one? Yeah, so um, it is fixed to the to the window. Um, and relative motion to the ISS. Um, no, so uh, the, um, the Astro Pi will be fit, uh, to the fixed to the window, so any accelerometer readings will be as per the, the ISF, it's as ISS itself. So uh, you, can, you can detect um, motion with that uh, and also um, use the telemetry data with uh, FM um, and it will, be, it will be sturdy so you'll be able to check um, that will be quite smooth so you'll be able to check that. Yeah. So if, you, if you've got our Astro Pi here so there's actually an arm that fits onto the side of the flight unit and that holds it in place over the circular window so it's completely fixed in place it doesn't move um, the view is static as what's seen outside of that window. Um, the next question is about the blue filter that's fitted on the back of AstroPy Izzy. So, um, is the blue filter installed in all experiments or should we indicate in the documentation of the experiment if we want it installed? Um, so, that, uh, that's an easy one to answer as well. It is installed for all the experiments. So, when you are writing your code, just assume that the blue filter is on. The next uh, question is a quite a specific one about coding. Um, it says, is there any possibility to test our code if we use the eFEM library to locate the ISS position in it? And if yes, how to do it? And that's from the Small Explorers team. 
I think Ben, you can show the the code snippet for that. Yeah, from the phase um, two guide. Can we switch to my uh, to my laptop? Okay. So, if we look at the uh, the phase two guide, the second section, getting started. So you have a look through it here. We've got some uh, information about the SD card images. So these two links are, are, are new. That was what I was just talking about. We've got the information about the one line installer, and that's how you get the the one line installer. Uh, and then further down, we've got a section on Python libraries. Uh, so we've got FM here. So this is a really simple example that just uses uh, the FM library to read the telemetry data provided here. So this is um, downloaded, this is stations.txt, which is a file you can download from the internet from this URL. You stick that on your Pi, um, and you take a look, you copy out each of those three lines into three variables here, just in strings. This can take, you need to make sure you get the entire thing, so all the way to the end and close the quotes there. The FM library is able to parse this information and, uh, and calculate where the ISS uh, is uh, based on that on that data. So if you can get up to date data on that, it'll be uh, it will be most accurate. We will. Um, you don't have to worry about submitting your code with this uh, with this in it. Uh, you just leave it in, and uh, it, it will be updated automatically when you run. So um, you can't you can't have a risk of being out of date there. But this example just um, calculates the ISS's position and prints out the latitude and longitude there. And then if I look further down. So right down the bottom, we've got re reverse geocoder. This is another library that's installed on the Astro Pi. Uh, reverse geocoder takes a latitude longitude coordinate and returns the nearest town or city. So uh, this is perfect for uh, use uh, tied with Pi FM. So if you use both together and you do the same thing where you get your latitude and longitude, and then you ask reverse geocoder to search for that position, to search for that coordinate, it will, um, it will give you back a little dictionary uh, of, of the result telling you where it is. So this here, CC, GH, this example uh, when I ran it was um, showed that it was in Ghana. So this is the country code for Ghana. And you can look in the documentation for a reverse geocoder on how to, um, you, you, could, you could look up the, the full country names, for instance, for using this information. The, the latitude and longitude is stored there as well. And uh, the name of the city there. So uh, Takaradi is a city in Ghana. So and another way to look at this is if you, if you take this latitude and longitude and go into Google Maps and just paste it into a search, just put a comma there. So latitude, comma, longitude. Put that in. And it's located the exact position um, there. So if I zoom out here, you'll be able to see where it is on the Earth. So there you are, Ghana. There's the country there, and you can see that's the position uh, of where the ISS uh, is above this. This is the nearest city to where it is. So the actual coordinate might be somewhere, say, here in the sea, but uh, that's the that's pulled out the nearest city. So if it was over here, over Chad, for instance, you'd you'd find it. It was it was actually nearer. Uh, it'd be, it be, could be flying over a city. Um, so you can you can get that uh, from from the result from that search which is really useful. What a lot of teams did uh, in last year's competition, this is the Flickr. These are all the different albums. So each one of these represents a different team's um, photographs taken uh, of from uh, life, life on Earth experiments last year. And some of them actually um, put their, um, they use that information. So this one is a really good example, actually. Code Warriors from Romania. They actually used um, matplotlib and a couple of other libraries to uh, create a map with a pinpoint of showing where um, where that photograph was taken. Now this is a bad example because there's actually it was actually a darkness photo. But if I scroll through and find a good one, so here, and they also did some processing on the image. So they they did a sort of color search. Um, it looks like this is um, Dubai here actually, and you can see on the map. Oh no, sorry, Mum uh, Mumbai. Um, and you can see some information from the Sensat. Uh, you can see some information they've, uh, some data they've calculated, and then they've stitched all the actual, the, the real photograph here, the uh, processed image here, and the map, and then the information here, which is a really cool um, use of that. Now, uh, what I would recommend is you, that you save the raw image that you that you take from the camera, and just save that so you've got a full full res, uh, full high res quality version of the image. And, uh, but then also 
you know, use your Python program to, to create these additional images with, um, if, you were, if you were going to do something like this. So there's some really interesting stuff you can do once you know uh, where a photograph was taken. Um, so we have a few coming in live, so I might uh, throw one of those over now. Um, so the first one is, um, is the Raspberry Pi on board the uh, ISS the same as the one that was included in the Astrobi kit? Good, very good question. Again, this is all covered in the Phase 2 guide. Uh, no, it isn't. So the Raspberry Pis on the ISS were the ones that were sent up in 2015. So they're a Raspberry Pi Model B+. Plus on there, yeah. Model B Plus. Uh, however, because we've released a number of new Raspberry Pis since then, the one you've been sent in your kits is a Raspberry Pi Model 3. So this one, had the, the Pi 3 here has a, a sensor on it, so I'll just take that off. Uh, but the, uh, the flight case here, so we've got one, this is the real Astro Pi. Um, that, this this um, is exactly what's up there, so it's, this is the flight case. It contains a Raspberry Pi 1 Model B Plus uh, with a sense hat. Uh, now the Raspberry Pis are all uh, compatible with each other, so the, the exact same uh, code will run on both of these. It will run a lot faster on the Pi 3, which is the one you've got in your kits. Um, so it is worth, if you've, got, if you've got one of these to hand, if you've got one of these available, it's worth just running your code on there as well. It's not, it's not the end of the world if you don't, uh, but just be aware that, um, that any code you run will, will run significantly slower on the Pi 1, which is, which is what's in space. And in fact, um, if, you, if you run our one-line installer script on a version of uh, Raspbian Lite, that will actually throttle the performance of the Pi to try and make it closer to the performance of the B+. So we, you can still run that on your Raspberry Pi 3, um, running the Raspbian Lite image, run the one-line installer, and that will reduce this one's performance so it's much closer to this one. The big difference is the amount of memory in the two Pis, and that, that's what means things like OpenCV or doing lots of image processing will run a lot slower on the B+. And also, the, um, we recommend you run the one-line installer on your Pi 3, not on the B+. It will be, um, you'll, you'll get to a complete um, image install much faster on a Pi 3, and it will still work on the B+. So if you wanted to do some testing on a B+, there's no harm in running the installer uh, on, your, on your Pi 3 to get there a lot, a lot faster. Um, there's no incompatibilities between the two. Uh, now, if you install OpenCV yourself, doing it sort of the manual way, and you install that on a Pi 3, you'll have a version that won't run on the Pi 1. But the one that we provided in the one-line installer and in the, the images we've provided uh, is the Pi 1 version, so it will run uh, on both. Uh, you can take your SD card out, put it in, uh, swap it between the Pi 3 and the Pi 1, and it will work the same. Any more questions coming, Erin? Yeah, um, we have one here that is, um, I'm completely new to coding, having only experienced Python with the Astro Pi for one day with ESA, and I'm men mentoring multiple groups of primary pupils aged nine. Is help available for writing code? Absolutely, that sounds like a, a great thing to be doing. Um, I would suggest the best place to go for that kind of help will be the Raspberry Pi website. Uh, the website, we've got lots of projects on there that take you through really um, getting started with Python up to some quite advanced uh, Python programming and activities you can do. Any, any other thoughts, Ben, where people could go for that um, sort of stuff? It's really good to have a, a community around you. So uh, any, uh, any technology groups that meet uh, in your area. So if you look for code clubs, code dojos, raspberry jams, uh, any way that you can meet other people who um, perhaps have a bit more experience with this that could, could help you out, um, debug any problems or overcome any issues you've had, uh, but also just get ideas and actually see what, what other people are doing, what, see what, look on the internet what projects people are making with the Raspberry Pi, just to get a feel for what, uh, what kind of things are out there and what, what you can do. Um, there's some amazing projects that are on the Raspberry Pi blog. And the thing to remember is all these amazing things that we read about, people sending their Raspberry Pis up on uh, high altitude balloons, sending them up, taking pictures of the Earth, um, people sending them down to the bottom of the ocean, people making robots, people, they've all got the same thing that you've got in your kits. It's the same computer, it's the same hardware, it's, they, didn't, uh, they didn't have anything, um, that anything you, you couldn't get hold of as well. So, um, and particularly have a look at what people are, are doing with their sense hats because this is uh, readily available to buy as, as well as the Raspberry Pi. So lots of people have done some cool stuff with that as well. 
I'd also suggest um, the new Raspberry Pi Beginner's Guide, which is available as a free PDF, and we'll pop the link to that in the, the yeah, we, channel here. We've got lots of publications as well as what's on our website and on our blog and, uh, and on our social media. We've got, um, we do a lot of public publications, which are um, available for free to download, and you can buy the hard copies as well. Um, so there, there's plenty of stuff out there that we that we produce and that that we share from um, community contributors that that write great stuff about the projects they've made. Um, so there's pl plenty of stuff to find, um, which you can all find through our website. So raspberrypi.org definitely a good place to start. Yeah. Um, can you use the camera to record a video and take photos at the same time? Uh, that's a good question. You can sort of, but it doesn't work very well. Basically, what you end up doing is recording a video and then taking frame grabs out of that video feed. Um, on a B plus, that that's very slow, and um, you'll find it quite difficult to do that. Um, I think I would recommend only taking still videos unless you have a real need still photos, still photos rather than doing a video. Uh, a still video is quite boring. Um, <laughs> I definitely recommend that uh, unless you have a particular need for a video feed. Obviously. Um, if you're photographing stuff for life on Earth, so looking out of the ISS window, uh, a nice way to make a movie of that is to do a time lapse, um, which you can see a really good example of on the loading page of the Phase 2 guide. Um, we've also had a couple of questions come in uh, in regards to the final report. Um, so can you provide some more details about the final report? Is there a template? Um, so in the, um, the overall Mission Space Lab guide, uh, we, which we'll post a link to in, in, the, um, in the feed here, uh, there is um, more information on exactly what you'll need to submit. So when you submit your program, um, you will need to provide a few details about uh, what your program's doing and, and the way that you intend to use the hardware. And then once, uh, if you're successful and your code is run on the ISS, you'll receive your, your data back. And then in order to uh, be eligible to uh, win uh, Mission Space Lab, um, you'll be writing a report. So we'll provide you with a template, um, which is uh, very easy to fill out. It'll be no more than two pages. Um, and uh, the link for the template is actually in um, the Mission Space Lab guide, but we'll also send that to you in the newsletter when it comes time to be writing that. So hopefully that answers questions there. Um, I had a, we had another question come in about the kit. Um, so I mentioned it at the start of the feed, but uh, I think everyone was sort of joining then still. So um, the kits should have arrived by now. If you haven't uh, arrived, if yours hasn't arrived in the mail, then please do get in touch with us. You can send us an, um, an email or just re respond to the, the newsletter. Let us know, and we will help track that down for you. Um, we... Should we go back to yeah. the questions that yeah. came in fine? Right, OK, where were we? Um, here's a long question. Uh, will the camera be oriented along the trajectory of the ISS or the north-south coordinates of the Earth? We need to know if we have a full terrestrial coverage of the equator area. The horizontal field of view of the camera isn't wide enough to cover all the area if the camera is oriented by the trajectory of the ISS. Um, so I think that question is all about what kind of view you'll see from where the flight base is pointing out of the window. So the astronauts, they, they take the ISSs from the ISSs, they take the Astro Pies from where they're stored on the ISS and, and put them up in the window before the experiment starts. And we don't have any, any control over how they do that. So you, you should just expect to get a view like the view that you see on the Flickr screen, on the Flickr um, archive uh, out the window of the ISS. So in, in terms of knowing the orientation in advance, that's not something that's possible. But those test images that, that are on the Flickr stream that Ben showed earlier, that's a really good place to test your code to see if you can switch, um, work out how your code will cope with not knowing exactly which way it's facing. Yep, so if we have a look at um this is one group's images from last year, Special Operations STEM from Belgium. Uh, there's some really good ones that, uh, uh, that, that uh, popped out at me just then. So uh, 
uh, yeah, as you can see, you've got this kind of, um, you can see the Astro Pi, uh, sorry, you can see the ISS window, uh, the, this kind of circular window we're looking at. We're looking directly down at Earth, so it's not like the photographs that you see uh, from ESA and from NASA, where they're looking diagonally out of the window and you can see the curvature of the Earth. Uh, these are just looking flat down at the Earth, and the, you have to remember that the, um, the ISS is relatively close to the Earth. It's not, you're not going to take a photograph that you know, encapsulates the, the blue marble, uh, the blue marble uh, photograph that's that, you know, famously, um, that famously taken. Um, I need to go oh, to the moon for that, right? Yeah. So the ISS is, uh, how, how far away is it from the Earth is it? A few kilometers. A few hundred kilometers. A few hundred kilometers. So it's not, you're not getting an entire view of the Earth. You're very, very um, close. So you can, you, can, uh, you can actually see, um, there's a few images that are of kind of, you can see a small island in the picture. So this one here, you can kind of see it's like the edge of a coastline there. Um, so it's they're, they're kind of really good quality satellite photographs that n nobody um, uh, these these ones are fantastic. Um, it's an incredible opportunity that you have to be able to um, take photographs like this. Um, and yeah, as I say, you're 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 down to kind of. Um, you can you can see the kind of coastlines here, and you can see you get a lot of cloud in the images. Um, you, there's going to be lots of stuff, where, lots of photos where you're not really capturing anything because you're just cloudy or you're just over the sea. Um, but uh, so I recommend taking quite a lot of pictures if you if you're really interested in what you're what you're going over and the, raising the, your chances of of getting some really good pictures. Um, Remembering and the three gigabyte limit, though. Yes. So, just be aware of how um, if you if you actually if you actually download a whole set of photographs from Flickr, I think from the top you can download a uh, there's a download link, so you can take a look at the um, the full size of these images as well. So if you take take one of these, for instance, and you download the um, um, the original and have a look at how big the image is, that will give you a good idea as well. Um, so t I would take, a m take as many as you can, but um, fitting into that three gig limit. So just be um, be aware of your, uh, you know, add adding up all your your maths together to um, to work out that. Okay. There, there was some follow ups to that question, um, which was: uh, Are the shutter open time and ISO sensitivity automatically set, or we do, or do we need to set them? So uh, the way that you will program the Pi camera is using the Pi camera library. If you just take um, a picture without specifying things like the shutter open time and the ISO sensitivity, uh, the camera will just make a best guess and use the auto settings. But if you want to specify a specific ISO setting, you can do that in your code using the Pi camera library. And again, in the phase two guide, there's a link through to all the documentation for Pi Camera, which is really comprehensive, really detailed, and will tell you exactly how to make the best of your photography opportunities. Yeah, and also take a look at the Pi Camera documentation. So that's pycamera.readthedocs.io, and you can read all about uh, all the settings that are available for the camera. Um, you can get really, really detailed on that, but I wouldn't get uh, too bogged down in. Um, uh, in, in setting those so specifically because you might risk, you know, sometimes you are better off just leaving it on auto unless you're, look, you're trying to do something very specific. Can we just flick it back to my, to my screen? I just found a really interesting picture here. So you can see this amazing, um, I can't see where this is because I don't have the information handy, but it's like a kind of windy river. And if you're lucky, like your photographs could include something really, really awesome like this where you've got this really interesting pattern. There's some great ones of kind of mountain ranges and stuff like that. Um, yeah, it's really cool. Okay. Great. Um, so I think we've answered the next couple questions already. There's a few people asking about are there sample images available? So as we've said, yes, there are on our Flickr stream. I think the link to that went out in the newsletter yep. as well. Yep. Yeah, so it's just flickr.com slash photo slash raspberry pi. And if you go to albums, you'll see, um, you can kind of flick through and quickly see the kind of thing you're looking for. So I recommend doing a lot of testing with these images, actually. So if, you, if you're writing an algorithm which will, say, detect color in, in, a, in a photograph, 
to try and work out whether you're over land or sea or just seeing lots of clouds. Definitely worth just running your algorithm over some of these um, JPEGs that you can download from Flickr because if you can refine your algorithm based on uh, rather than having your actual Raspberry Pi camera, say, pointing out into the sky looking at clouds, these photographs are much more realistic of what you're likely to expect. So this, um, it couldn't get any better than having the real thing. So it's the exact same camera, the exact same hardware from, from the same position. So um, nobody's had this, uh, had this opportunity before. So we've, we've never released these before. So um, I would definitely make the, make the most of that. So just a clarification on our earlier um, explanation of the three gigabyte uh, limit. So um, if it's terminated because you exceed the three gigabyte limit, will it still be recorded up to three gigabytes or will it all be deleted and no data obtained? No, your, your program will, all the data it's recorded up until that point will be saved. Um, but we really strongly encourage you to write your program such that you don't exceed that limit. Um, and can you take photos with high exposure? Yes, you can. Again, all through the wonderful Pi Camera Library. You have complete control over the images that you take. Yeah. Um, just to add to um, the, what we're talking about with Pi Camera, um, a lot of the photographs you'll see on Flickr, um, such as this one, if we just flick back, um, these ones have actually got the uh, camera overlays. There's a really nice uh, and useful feature of Pi, the Pi Camera li Library that allows you to overlay text onto your images, uh, which is really useful and it has, um, uh, has its use. But I wouldn't recommend you do this uh, on your images you take in, in your experiment because uh, A, if you're, uh, if you're trying to say do color detection, um, one thing to look out for is to not count the uh, outside. So what you can do is crop the image and only look at the sort of center rectangle um, and use that bit to to, to read in, because uh, otherwise your algorithm will be swayed by the, the white from the, the edge of the, um, the window. But also by, if you're writing text over the top of the image as well, you're going to have a lot of black and white that, that, that's going to mess with your, um, with, with your algorithm. Um, what we've recommended in the guide, and you can read specifically how to do this with, um, uh, in, in, in Pi Camera is to write to the EXIF data. So that's the data, actually, I can see some of it here. If I scroll down, you can see all this information here is from is the EXIF data from, uh, from the Raspberry Pi camera. So it says here that this photo was taken by a camera called, Ras you know, with Raspberry Pi RP OV something. So that's the model of the, ras of the camera that was taken. Uh, it shows you the aperture, the um, uh, the ISO and, and it's saying the, the, the flash didn't fire because the, the Raspberry Pi camera doesn't have a flash. And there's lots more information in the, in the EXIF data. You can actually um, push more data into that. So we're recommending people use that to save the location, uh, the, so the geolocation of the data. So you've actually got it without spoiling the, the raw image itself. So when you've got your image, if you wanted to print off this image and, um, and you know, have, it, have it professionally printed, put it on the wall to say this is a photograph I took in space, You've got the original without the sort of um, uh, the, inf the extra information overlaid on the top. Now, if you wanted to do that later because you wanted it to be there, then at least you've still got the choice of adding it in yourself later. So uh, definitely keep the preserve the uh, the original image and and embed any information you want to in into the um, the EXIF data. Um, and one more question: the the images um, are all of these images colorized? Or are they unstable? You mean have they been have they been post processed? Been, yes, I think that's what. Uh, these these should all be the raw images that so were taken. So the, the or everything's been uploaded was uh, was as it was saved by the team. Mm -hmm. So if the team did some processing in Python and then right. saved an image, then that's what we've got. So some of them are just raw, exactly what was taken. Some of them are, are sort of raw, but with the text overlays that, that were defined in the, in the Python programs. Some of them, like the ones I showed you earlier, had, um, had you know, been put onto graphs or been, uh, had color manipulation on them and things like that. Um, but most of them on there are, are just raw. Um, so you can choose to, again, what, what I would suggest, if you're going to do any processing um, during your experiment, I would recommend saving a raw, raw one and doing some manipulation as well. Mm -hmm. Don't throw away um, 
uh, anything that you um, uh, don't throw away the raw images if you're going to do some processing. Okay. Um, should we go back to these? Yeah. Uh, there's one more question on photos here, um, which was around: uh, Are there any factors that could hamper the visibility of Earth from the ISS? Uh, so obviously there's a few things to think about when your when your three hour experiment window comes up. The first is that the, the ISS orbits the Earth really quickly, so you're not going to have a complete cycle of, of all day or either all night. You'll probably get some nighttime, some daytime as the ISS moves around the Earth. Um, so that will obviously make it harder to see things on the ground. Obviously, as we've seen from lots of these images, clouds are a big issue. I mean, the clouds are still on the Earth, but they, they're stopping you from seeing the land beneath it. So that's a factor to be aware of as well. Um, in terms of other obstructions, there shouldn't be any. Uh, one of the things we, we do and, and ESA works on on our behalf is to make sure uh, when the Astro Pi experiments are running that there is nothing obscure in the view from the porthole window which the ISS, which the um, Astro Pi is pointing out of. Can we just flick to the to my screen? So um, this is something I didn't actually specifically didn't upload a, a lot of images that were. Um, that were just black. So we, we, um, we noticed that a lot of images taken were just purely a black screen because you can't see anything in the image because it's in a nighttime phase of the ISS. So the sun's on the other side of the Earth. The ISS is taking pictures of, of the Earth, but it's completely black. Now, we haven't been able to um, uh, take, you know, get, a, get a, any good um, images uh, in, in the nighttime phase. And we've recommended to people that are trying to take photos in the night phase, um, but, but that's not something they should concentrate on. Um, so I, I specifically didn't upload the nighttime pictures. However, there's a few in there that you'll see that, um, so I'm just looking at one here that's uh, probably just going into the nighttime phase. You can actually see uh, the, the sun sort of bouncing off the, the edge of the, um, the window here. Uh, and then if you look through the next few, you'll see um, a few examples of just kind of cl cloudy images. Um, so you can see some of them you just don't really get much in, but then some of them you get a big glare because the sun's just just in the corner of the view. Um, but I didn't specifically didn't upload the, the nighttime one. So you can see um, you can see in some of them you'll see the nighttime phase coming into action which looks something like this. But the, uh, as far as kind of foreign objects go, there's going to be nothing uh, in the way of, of your, your between the ISS and the Earth. Uh, except for clouds. So sometimes you're going to be over the sea, sometimes you're going to be over land. Either way, you, you've got the potential of being over, uh, having clouds obscuring your view. The only other thing is uh, the relative position of the sun. So whether it's on the, the wrong side of the earth to be able to see anything or, um, or that it's just coming into view or out of view. Great. I think that's uh, probably enough on photos for now. There's a few more questions around um, setting up your pie ready to do your development and testing. Uh, one question is, um, the Raspbian image supplied appears to be the standard Raspbian image. That's correct. Uh, are there any essential packages that need to be installed? So as we said earlier on, um, there's the one line installer script that will, will set up your Pi so that it has everything you need and put all the packages that are available on the ISS Astro Pies ready to use. Um, and it sounds like this team has tried that because they say the package installation and they give the command to type um, from the phase two guide did not appear to do anything. Is there a way to check? Um, you definitely should see a, a stream of messages coming up when you run that um, when you run that command. If you're not seeing anything at all, I think what's perhaps happening is that your the network you're on um, is somehow blocking um, the link to the Raspberry Pi website, uh, or perhaps you're not even online at all. So first thing to check is that you've got an uh, internet connection on the Pi. So maybe just go and visit a website through the browser, uh, and then uh, you can try some command line um, commands that we can put uh, in the in the in the the, the chat afterwards um, that will just test your connectivity. Um, we do use a shortened URL for the one line installer, so we've got an rpf.io link. Um, some school sites specifically do block shortened links, um, so what we'll also do is we'll make the full link full unshortened link available and it may be worth trying that in your command to see if that's what's stopping it from working. So that's uh, the full URL is now in the um, in the phase two guide so you can find that as well but if you just switch to my screen again 
Uh, this is the source of the um, where the uh, the one line installer script is is being loaded from GitHub. So if you go to github.com slash astropy slash astropy stretch installer, you'll find everything in here. So uh, you've got a bit of in the readme, it tells you a bit about what what uh, what it's for. This is uh, the, the instructions that we've given on how to run it. So you open a terminal and you type curl this URL into here, into bash, and it will execute that script. Now, as Richard said, if you can't get to rpf.io because it, it's uh, the short, short URLs are um, blocked on your domain, uh, we've provided the, um, the full URL in the guide. Uh, so it's just here. So here it says curl this uh, rpf link. Now it says if, if RPF is not accessible, this is the full URL. So you can use that. And if you take a look uh, at that script as well, so setup.sh. So I won't go through all of this in great detail, but uh, the, um, the script just, this, is, this shows you exactly what's happening. So if you were to try one of the commands, for instance, like um, sudo apt update, and, and you know you should see the, the, the results of that uh, in your terminal window. You should see some either an error message saying it can't get to um, raspbian.org, or you should see some output actually of it uh, running it, running updates and, uh, and installing packages. Um, but you shouldn't need to go into great detail into looking at what this does. But it's there if you need to. You should definitely see some some output from from running that. We've kind of minified it so you don't get load too much information, but um, should be seeing updates with a timestamp saying, oh, um, in, in fact, the first thing it should do is, is to say, you know, we've noticed you're running Raspbian Stretch and starting AstroPy setup. Or if you're using an old uh, image that, that isn't supported, it will tell you that as well. Um, then it will go on to uh, enable a camera interface and tell you that it's done that. So these are things that don't actually um, um, rely on having a solid internet connection, but you just need to have got this far. It could be you lose internet connection partway through doing this. So there's a few things that could go wrong, but um, generally speaking, if you uh, have an issue, try and get onto a solid internet connection and run the installer again. Uh, it shouldn't have any, any issues retrying. You do need an internet connection to get the installer script yeah, in the first yeah, place. Yeah. So if that bit fails, it'll... Yeah, but I just meant if, um, if you start with an internet connection and you lose yeah. it partway, it could be that you get an error partway through. It's worth remembering the script does take a because it's installing quite a lot of extra software on there. Um, normally, with a reasonably fast internet connection, it takes about 30 to 35 minutes. So if you're planning on doing that um, before a session where you're going to do some coding, make sure you get that loaded for the session, not, not at the start of the session. There's another sort of uh, coding question that's come in here um, with some more errors people are seeing. It says, uh, do you possibly know why we get the following error when trying to load log zero module? And the error they're getting is an import error, no module named log zero. And the team, this is uh, Raman8, are saying, we ran the AstroPy stretch installer script and everything else is working. So any ideas so that, that could a, And there's a few things this could be. Um, we, we, we were thinking about this earlier. One thing could be that, uh, that this team is, is trying to run Python 2, for instance, and they're, they're trying to import log zero. Now, we don't, we're not running Python 2 um, experiments this year, so it's Python 3 only. Um, so if you've written, if you've opened up a terminal and typed Python, you'll actually get Python 2. So if you're, if you're trying that, just run Python 3 and you'll be in a Python, uh, you'll be in a Python 3 prompt which has all these libraries available. Uh, so if you're trying to run um, code that is written for Python 2, it needs, it needs converting to Python 3. Uh, but if you open up one of the Python editors that's available in the image, um, all of those are for Python 3 only. So um, it, sh it should work fine in there. It's, it's not possible to run the, um, the one-line installer script and then end up with a system that doesn't have those libraries installed because we do a check after we've installed all the Python libraries, we run a test script to just see that they can all import correctly. So um, import error no module name log zero doesn't, um, shouldn't happen at that point except if you're trying to do it with Python 2, for instance. Uh, there was a, um, I, I had an email from somebody earlier saying that they tried to run the one line installer and then they'd, um, and it had errored trying to install OpenCV. Now there was uh, an issue that we identified just in the last couple of days uh, must have come up. So anyone who did it 
a few days ago wouldn't have had this problem, but um, a new version of OpenCV was released, um, and it was trying, but it was failing to ins to uh, to download it. Uh, now that has been resolved just by a, a small change to the uh, the one line installer script, so that it actually downloads the the the, the version that's uh, it just specific specifically installs the version that we've got on the Astro Pi. So um, that error with the the missing latest version of OpenCV. Uh, should have gone away now. So going back to Roman 8, I think our advice would be make sure you're running Python 3 and if all else fails, run the installer again. Definitely. Um, so we have quite a few more questions oh, coming good, on, good. in on the live stream. So um, we might try and do some of these quick fire. Um, so um, Judith wanted to know if we have photos from other editions available um, that could be uploaded on Flickr. From previous from years' previous competitions. Years, yeah. Uh, no, we don't. Okay, <laughs> that was easily. There, there are um, there are lots and lots and lots of uh, photos on Flickr. So I think the first time the link was sent out, I hadn't finished doing the upload. So I've only up I'd only uploaded about maybe ten teams. The entire set have been uploaded now. So everything that's available from last year. So if you if you haven't had a look in the last week, I would definitely go and check it out again. Click on albums. And you'll see them in groups, so you can kind of identify uh, what what generally um, is is kind of going to be in, uh, likely to be in that uh, that set. Definitely take another look. Uh, some really really interesting photo sets in there, and you can also see how many are in each one. So, just looking at this, just one row here. I've got one with three hundred eight, one with one hundred fifty eight, one with four hundred eighty three, one with thirty seven, and one with twenty eight. So the, each of these is a different team's experiment, um, and depending on their code and depending on uh, how often they're taking photographs, uh, and also how I've, I've filtered out all the complete darkness ones. So depending on that, it uh, depends on how many are in each group. But there are, uh, one second, there are a total of, there are a total of 10,709 photos on Flickr. So that's probably enough. <laughs> I think probably enough. Um, we have a question from Klaus. Is there a library or code that allows us to check if the ISS is in the night or light zone at a given time? Uh, so uh, OpenCV and uh, PIL, the Python Imaging Library, are two really good um, options for that, and both available on the on the image. Uh, so. The, the the nighttime photographs, like the, the actual complete complete darkness ones, will be really really easy to, to do with that. So if you take a look at um, all of the pixels, and you look at if just if you say if you set a threshold at a particular darkness, and say um, let's look um, to see what the the average pixel value of the whole screen is, and if that's if that's particularly if that's um, beyond that threshold, then you can discount that uh, that photo. Um, what we're looking at, if you're just talking again about the nighttime photography, if you just to my screen, please. So this is um, this is a picture taken not from a Raspberry Pi. I should add, this was taken out of the window of the ISS um, using a normal SLR camera. I think you can see, as Ben mentioned earlier, there's a there's a kind of a diagonal uh, angle on that picture, um, and this is Mexico City taken with a normal SLR camera. You can see plenty of lights available at night. Uh, and now I'm going to show you a picture taken of Mexico City using. Um, the camera on one of the Astro Pies. Uh, if you look very closely, there are of some, a few white pixels in there towards the top left, but you can see that nighttime photos of city lights are really hard to get right. Um, we carried out this year uh, some tests trying lots of different settings within the Pi camera library to try and work out if there was a particular thing we needed to do in order to get um, nice pictures like this rather than ones like this. And unfortunately, we couldn't find any settings that really improved it particularly well. So I think if you're looking to try and photograph city lights or things at nights, um, you really need to try and uh, come up with as a wide range of settings as possible in the hope of actually getting something that's going to be usable. I definitely recommend testing your um, code if you've written some code using PIL or using OpenCV to detect whether it's darkness or not. Uh, definitely test that on the images from the ISS. So if your algorithm says that um, a picture that you can clearly see it has got you know uh, sea or land or um, anything in it um, anything interesting that you want to keep and your algorithm says no I think this one's darkness then 
you know that you know you don't want to be running that code in your experiment because it's going to be throwing away, uh, throwing away good quality images. But if it uh, if you can correctly identify real, true nighttime fo uh, photos and, and know you can just discard them, then uh, you're in a good position. A uh, couple more quick ones about the camera. So um, what's the aspect ratio of the camera and what's the resolution of the video? Uh, so all that information, one thing worth remembering as well is that uh, the cameras on the flight units on the ISS are the V1 cameras, whereas the cameras that you're given in your kits are the version 2 cameras. So the version 2 cameras do have a higher resolution than the version 1s. Uh, in the phase one, in the phase 2 guide, it talks about that in a lot of detail and it has the specific values yeah. that you'd need to know and what you can use. So yeah, in, in step 2, uh, in the section about the camera, uh, so using the hardware, the section there in, includes a list of all the, um, uh, all the available resolutions. Now the maximum resolution, it's this one, isn't it? Uh, yeah. 2592 by 1944. So it's a reasonably reasonably high resolution, but uh, not as high as the, what you'll get on your V2 camera, which is in your uh, Astro Pi kit. Uh, one more quick question um, is, uh, can you use multi-thread Python programs, or is it restricted to only one thread? Uh, one single thread only. Great. Um, and... Uh, what does the stretcher library do? What does the stretcher library do? Stretcher. I think the stretch. No, so no. stretch stretch is the name of the operating system. So uh, Raspbian Stretch is the uh, version of Raspbian that we're using at, that's that's live at the moment for uh, Raspberry Pi users, and it's what we've upgraded the Astro Pis to use. Um, it's, it's, the Raspbian names come from uh, Debian. So the Debian project is, a, is an operating system for PCs. Raspbian is the equivalent of that for, um, uh, for Raspberry Pi hardware. And the, the, Debian project, uh, the Debian project names their operating system releases after characters from Toy Story. So <laughs> the last one was Jesse, and the, um, the current one is, uh, is Stretch, which is the octopus, and the next one will be Buster. <laughs> Great. Um, we're probably going to need to wrap things up pretty soon. Um, but one of the thi what things that we wanted to cover was um, uh, uh, many people who were accepted into the next phase of Mission Space Lab will have received some feedback on um, the idea that they submitted in the first phase. Um, so we wanted to just quickly refresh on some of that feedback, some of the common things that came up. Um, Richard, do you Shall want to I run through them so really quickly? One common uh, uh, misconception that some teams had, and this happened last year as well, is um, thinking that the IR camera, the Pi Noir camera on Izzy, is capable of doing thermal imaging. In other words, detecting how hot or cold uh, an object is that it's photographing. So the Pi Noir camera isn't a thermal imaging camera. You can't detect heat from it. It's simply a normal uh, Pi camera with the IR filter removed so that it detects IR light and it's better for low light sensitivity work. And specific event or location, so um, uh, a lot of ideas had to do with um, have wanting to fly over something specific or um, looking for specific things happening such as um, cyclones or particular weather events, things like that. So it's worth keeping in mind that your program only runs for three hours and that we can't uh, program it to run over a particular city or area of the earth. Um, so uh, try to keep that in mind when designing your experiment that there is a very low probability that you might um, be able to run at a specific time or a um, over a specific part of, of the earth. Yep. Um, so just important to remember that all these programs are just uh, queued up, so they'll happen one after the next three hours in, uh, in three hour slots. Um, you can you can be quite vague about your um, your expectations if you if you wait, want to look for coastlines, for instance. That's common enough that you're going you're likely to see a see a coastline in your you know see lots of coastlines in your three hours. Or if you're looking at clouds, you're going to see clouds. You're look, going to see lots of sea. If you're looking for a specific country or a specific city or a specific type of event. There's almost no chance of you being able to um, 
assume that you're going to get um, what you're looking for. Worth remembering in that three hour period, um, some of that will be nighttime as well. So it's not like you'll have three hours of continuous views of the earth to, to look for. So people who are looking for erupting volcanoes or polar bears, your, your chances of finding them are very, 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 very slim. And again, if, you, if, your, if your experiment idea can't be proven by, um, you know, if it's something like that, that you can't uh, test on the image, the 10,000 images we've got, uh, we've provided already. So if you, if, you, if you write a program to look for polar bears in all of those 10,000 images, you won't, you know, you won't find a single one. Uh, you can tell from these images, I said, I said before that they're quite close to Earth, they're not, you're not so far away, you can see the entire Earth in one photo, but they're not so close that you can see something as specific as that. So but just use these for, uh, for reference, and as I say, you're really lucky that you've got these. Nobody uh, in Astro Pi competitions before have, has had these, uh, these available. Um, the next thing to keep in mind is the, the limitations of the hardware and the situation up on the ISS. So um, we can't provide any extra equipment. It, it costs a lot of money to send things up there. So all that is available is what we have told you about and what is in your kit. Um, so there can't be any extra parts to your experiment um, sent up there or anything like that. And in addition, there can't be any crew interaction. Um, the, the astronauts are incredibly busy people and we try and send as many different experiments up there as possible and they just can't interact with all the different experiments that are happening. So no crew interaction and no special equipment uh, is available, just what we've provided. And that includes asking the, um, the crew to start the experiment at a particular time by pressing a button, for example. So in the past, in earlier Astro Pi competitions, there was some interaction with the crew and we could ask them to press buttons and things. That, that doesn't happen now. So your code shouldn't rely on anything happening on uh, the joystick or the buttons on the Astro Pi. And in terms of extra equipment, that also includes um, having stuff that's already on the ISS moved. So for example, if there's plants on the ISS, we can't ask for those to be put in front of the camera. And uh, finally, it's important to remember that Mission Space Lab is all about um, running a scientific experiment up on uh, the ISS. So there are a few ideas that were, um, that were submitted, which weren't quite experiments, were more like um, games. And so uh, in those cases, uh, we have asked you to resubmit an idea that is a, an experiment and is looking at a hypothesis. Um, so next, are we going to move on? I just want to talk about testing. Oh, yeah. It's really testing, important. Um, one thing on, if you go to the, the phase two guide, um, you can see there's, a, there's a, a large section on test your code. And this is really important. Once you think you've got your code working, you really need to test it and test it several times. Um, we talked earlier about making an image or using the light version of Raspbian. So that's no windows, no, no applications, just command line tools. Um, you should definitely do that and test that. And in particular, um, this section has a final check uh, area in it here, which talks about specific things you should make sure your code either does or doesn't do. So just having a look in there quickly, um, your experiment does not rely on interaction with an astronaut. Uh, make sure your program is written in Python 3. Uh, your program does not rely on any additional libraries other than those that are in the guide. Your program does not use any networking, so you can't try and um, use any other equipment that's on the ISS, nor is the, uh, the Astro Pi is connected to the internet, so you can't use any internet services as part of your code. Uh, make sure you've documented your program. That's really important, well, particularly when we come to judge the entries, we really need to understand what the code does, so uh, use really uh, helpful variable names and make sure you add in plenty of comments so we understand what's going on. Also in the guide, it talks really specifically about how your data needs to be saved. That's in terms of the file names you used and where you save it. You must follow those things. Um, when we test your code, we're going to run it on our versions, on our flight units here. Um, if it doesn't save data into the right place or doesn't behave in the way that the program is described in the phase two guide, then it won't be very successful in our judging criteria. Um, you should also uh, make sure you chosen the right theme for your for your project so whether that's life in space or life on earth and remember that any images taken with the camera as part of life on earth must be deleted at the end of your life in space, life in space must be deleted at the end of your program i always get that wrong <laughs> 
Um, also, your program should stop after three hours. So that needs to be part of your, your experimental code, making sure that after three hours of activity, the program stops itself. And again, in the phase two guide, there's a really good code example of how you make that happen. Uh, and finally, um, the LED matrix on here should update fairly regularly. Um, that's because although the astronauts aren't able to interact with the program, they will keep an eye on the Astro Pi. And if they see that the screen's dead or that there's an image on there that's not changing for a long period of time, when they know the experiments are running, they may think that something's gone wrong. So you should have a little status indicator of some kind, some kind of animation or just a single pixel that changes to make sure the astronauts know that things are still running. Once again, in the phase two guide, it explains how to do that. Um, and finally, and this is really obvious, um, make sure there's no bad language or anything offensive contained within your code or that's displayed on the Astro Pi. Yeah, so just to reiterate, download that um, light image, the, 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 um, the Astro Pi light image, put that on an SD card, don't do anything to it, put your code, just put your code on there and run your code and it should work. Leave it running for several hours, more than three hours if, uh, uh, if possible, and just keep it, keep it running. Run it, run it several times if you get a chance, just to see if that one odd situation comes up that makes your code fall over, makes an ex exception thrown. Because if you, if you test it once and you get, no, you get no errors, but then you send it to space and something obscure happens like it's your, your, if you, you know, we had people last year who assumed they were always going to be over a country, not never over sea, and they ran their code and tested it, but it, and it worked fine. But they sent it up to space, and then it had an exception where if it, you know, if it went out of a particular range or it didn't come back with a country, then their their code didn't wasn't able to handle that, so it just exited and and they, their experiment just didn't run, so they didn't have any any results and didn't have any anything to show. So just really, really um, do lots of testing and make sure that you cover all scenarios. We've provided lots of information in the guide on how to deal with exceptions and lots of other useful information on the best way to just secure your chance of a successful experiment. I think it's fair to say teams should spend a lot of time looking at the guide. <laughs> Have we reiterated that? I think enough? we said that enough, right? Um, so I think that might be all that we have time for, unless there's any last burning topics for you guys. Um, there were a couple questions that came in that we didn't have a chance to get to. Please do send those in by email if, if we um, haven't been able to answer them here. And also read the phase two guide again because I can guarantee it's covered in there. Um, but thank you all so much for joining us this evening. Um, I'd like to say there are a few questions about what happens next, about the submission process. Um, we will be sending out more details in the newsletter. We'll also be sending out more information as we go along about where you should be up to in the process and uh, trying to help support you along the way. So watch out for those uh, newsletters. And uh, a reminder again, if you haven't received your kit in the mail, please do get in touch with us and we will help sort that out. Um, but yeah, thank you all very much for joining us this evening. And um, we're really looking forward to seeing your experiments when you yeah. send it to us. Yeah, it's going to be fantastic. All right. Bye, guys. Bye. Thanks. Bye.